Good evening. I want to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, uh, lecture by a Nobel laureate, Professor Kurt Wuttrich. It is indeed a very rare and precious occasion when we have Nobel laureates visiting our campus. So I'm delighted that so many of you have uh, chosen to come and, um, and listen to him today. I'm also very pleased that um, this inaugural uh, lecture is being given by Professor Wuttrich, whose work is very well known to many of our faculty, in our, you know, particularly in our chemistry department and uh, biotechnology department. I'm also very happy that uh, this uh, Nobel Laureate Lecture C Series is being sponsored by industry, um, Larson and Tubro Construction. Uh, in particular, Uh, in particular, I want to thank Mr. K. V. Rangasamy, one of our distinguished alumni who uh, worked for a long time at LNT and recently retired, I believe, but still continues to be very active with LNT. Um, it's always a, a pleasure when industry uh, joins hands with academia to bring such uh, outstanding and distinguished speakers to the campus. Uh, with that, I want to hand the mic over. Um, perhaps before that, we will, I'll ask our director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, to hand a memento to Professor Wuttrich. I will now invite, request Professor Chandra Kumar from our Department of Chemistry to provide an introduction to the speaker today. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to all of you. It's delightful to have a full house, as usual, on such great occasions. It's a rare privilege for me to have this opportunity to introduce the distinguished speaker this evening to you all, Professor Kurt Wittrich. Professor Kurt Wittrich was awarded to start from the latest, in a sense, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002 for his development of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy for determining the three-dimensional structure of biological macromolecules in solution. So I think the two catchphrases there which would catch everybody's attention here is a three-dimensional structure of biological macromolecules in solution. That's the unique power of his work. But then that doesn't happen overnight, and there is a short little history that I will take you through to see how he reached where he reached in a certain sense, his personal uh, progress from where he started to uh, uh, where he is uh, currently at will certainly be the core of his own talk, and I have no intention of trying to get into that. It would certainly be no exaggeration to say that Professor Wittrich and his group have pioneered and essentially single-handedly put nuclear magnetic resonance as a technique of pivotal significance in understanding three-dimensional structures of proteins at atomic resolutions. The most recent breakthrough, which uh, probably might have been one of the immediate triggers of the award of the Nobel in 2002 to him, was his breaking of a very significant barrier. It had been the belief in the scientific community, and NMR goes back to about 1946, it was by no means a very young technique when Professor Wittrich started working with it. It had been a fairly well-established belief based on practice that nuclear magnetic resonance was probably no go beyond molecular sizes of, let's say, about 25 kilo Dalton. So if you really talk about proteins and biomacromolecules, one would immediately assume that it's out. And I think that was the most significant breakthrough uh, on the back of any number of uh, uh, very significant earlier contributions of his, which was, as it were, the last straw for the triggering of the Nobel in a certain sense. At one fell blow, Professor Kurt established the technique of transverse relaxation optimized spectroscopy, which he chose to call as TROZI, which showed that far from the intuitive understanding that as molecular sizes grow, NMR becomes more and more powerless because of the fact that nuclear magnetic resonance spectral lines become significantly broadened with 
increasing molecular size, he was able to show that in contrast to the general expectation, there is a certain peculiar feature in the spin-coupled multiplets of spin pairs, for example, where one specific line would in fact be sharpened while others were broadened, provided the molecular size and the magnetic field intensity of the NMR measurement exceeded a certain threshold. And this was the breakthrough which he first demonstrated somewhere around 1997, if memory serves me right, of Trozzi, which he demonstrated probably to begin with at about the 90 kilodalton level, but subsequently, of course, he went on to an order of magnitude still larger, talking about the NMR characterization by Trozzi and other closely related techniques which he and his group also pioneered, including Crinept, uh, for, uh, let's say, the co-chaperonin chaperonin complex, where the total molecular size one is talking about is really getting up and knocking the doors of one megadalton. But then, in this business of multidimensional NMR, of which Trozzi is such an important aspect in solving biomolecular structures, uh, he is um, obviously a multidimensional NMR spectroscopist. But Kurt is far more than a multidimensional NMR spectroscopist. He's a multifaceted personality. I think it would be of special interest to this uh, young audience, especially, to know that Kurt Wittrich was born in rural Switzerland and studied maths, physics, as well as chemistry at the Gymnasium Biel. He then went on to study at the University of Bern. And as we have noted in one of the posters, he has a very unique combination of interests, which apparently make great academics. He has interest in forests, in farms, in fishing, in football, and French. I understand his own mother tongue, if I may put it that way, is Swiss German. But then he was probably, in his early years, brought up in a bilingual canton or district of Switzerland, and then, therefore, has equal love for the French language as well. He went on to major in sports and took a Eidgenössische Turn on Sportlehrer Diplom, which is a sports teacher uh, degree and also a PhD in inorganic chemistry, working with transition metal complexes and EPR, not NMR to begin with, which is a sister technique or the twin sister, if I may put it that way, of NMR, electron paramagnetic resonance. He was teacher at schools, teaching physics, teaching chemistry, sometimes at his alma mater. He also was a sports teacher, a ski instructor, and I couldn't help wondering and asking myself, I haven't got around to asking him as yet, whether people like Michael Schumacher and Angela Merkel might have been spared their current miseries had they been instructed in ski running at the hands of Kurt Wittrich. Clearly, he was no part of that. He was also a teacher of gymnastics, I must share this, at a Mädchen Gymnasium, which is a girls' school. And this evening, when he visited the central school, he was particularly keen to find out how high the high jumpers would jump. And exhorted the principal repeatedly that he shall make better provisions for high jumping. Because here is a man who delights in the fact that his sports triggered his science, and has, the science has not kept back his sports. And in fact, he has recorded as part of his Nobel recollections that what triggered his work in NMR, moving away from coordination chemistry, moving away from EPR, moving then further away from the salvation of ions studied by both NMR relaxation as well as EPR, into the NMR study of biomolecules proper was his wish to excel in sports. He wanted to see how he and his blood hemoglobin could have better oxygen uptake. And he was in the Bell Telephone Labs at this time. They had a 220 megahertz NMR spectrometer, which was a record in those years. And what better way to find out how he could spruce up his hemoglobin than to extract his own blood and the hemoglobin out of it and then embark on his NMR career. So that is how his studies in NMR began. He spilled blood to do his NMR work to begin with. Subsequently, of course, after his stint at the Bell Telephone Labs, he was back with the ETH in Zurich, Privat Dozent in 1970, going on to become professor of biophysics in 1980 and chairman of the biology department from 95 to 2000. Secretary General of the International Union of Pure and Applied Biophysics, IUPAB, 
For six years, from 1978, member of the General Committee of ICSU, the International Council of Scientific Unions, as well as of its Standing Committee on Free Circulation of Scientists. He says that this stint with the IUPAB and the ICSU really added a great deal of dimensions to his international outlook, and he has developed very strong professional links all across the globe, and in particular, also with India. In addition to his being awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002, he's won innumerable other international awards, as one would expect to hear, and also a large number of honorary degrees in the last four decades. I would just mention two of them, uh, because as Indians, we take pride in recognizing uh, quality at the highest level. He won the President's Gold Medal from the Government of India, and he also won the G. N. Ramachandran Lectureship of the Indian Biophysical Society. <laughs> He's been a visiting faculty all around the world. He's a member of various scientific advisory boards, patronage committees, currently at the Scripps Research Institute, La Jolla, California, as well as the ETH in Zurich. Let me not take any further time to stand between you and the person we all want to hear this evening, Professor Vitri. That's well, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for all those who have to stand, but it's probably as good as sitting down for your back. I'm amazed. I thank you for the kind introduction. I'm amazed about the amount of detail that you, you must have studied a lot of literature to find out about all these things, some of which I have long forgotten. But it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about past work and also briefly about the work that we are currently pursuing. The past work is in structural biology, and the current work is in structural genomics. Going from structural biology to structural genomics is a very major step, and it reflects a big change in biological, biomedical sciences, agricultural sciences, and so on, which came about by the fact that the complete genomes, that is the DNA sequences in the genomes of a large number of organisms could be determined, and including the human genome and the mouse genome, almost equally important and many more there are thousands of there are complete genome sequences available today of several thousand organisms mostly lower organisms but a wide range of higher organisms as well and this change in mainly biological and biomedical research is reflected by the move from structural biology to structural genomics. Hmm. Uh, you should perhaps tell me how this machine... Oh, it's here, okay. Well, let me show to you what sort of structures we work. You will see we work with the same kind of structures in structural biology and in structural genomics. It is a strategy, it's a basic idea behind the selection of the targets for our work, which has changed. So you see here, it's a simplified structure of a small protein. It's an NMR structure, that's why you have this variable thickness of that uh, line. And what it shows is that you have a linear chain. 
It's, yeah, I repeat what I've just done for the high school students. So we are dealing with this sort of a chemical structure. Okay, it's a linear chain. And now in this picture, this linear chain forms so-called helices, see, second helix and the third helix. And it is nicely called it. So it's always a pleasure to get such results and then use the computers to get nice presentations of this work. Here I show you another example. This is a bit more complete a drawing because it, all the atoms are now shown in this structure and it's also a more complicated structure in the sense that it contains two macromolecules one is a piece of DNA, the other is a protein in blue that is attached to the DNA and this it happens to be a homeodomain, the binding of the homeodomain to the DNA decides on what part of the genome is expressed in different parts of our body. So it decides on whether uh, hair is, it would be unfortunate if you had eyes on your head instead of hair. Or uh, you need skin, you need enzymes in your body. Actually, a friend of mine has managed uh, to get Drosophila flies to carry eyes on the elbows and on the legs by uh, smart uh, modification of the genome. So it is very important, we work together on, on this particular uh, problem, so it is very important to understand how these regulating proteins interact with the DNA in order to assure proper differentiation in higher organisms. Now when we look at proteins, we find on the one hand that they have very simple and largely uniform structures. As I've shown with my belt, we have a linear chain and this linear chain we have only 20 different building blocks, the amino acids. And the amino acids do vary in their chemical structure but not very much. The variations in the chemical structure of different proteins is in no way sufficient to warrant that proteins would perform a wide variety of different functions. But indeed they do. I have selected just a few here. Proteins have protective functions. That is, our hair consists of protein and our skin consists of protein. We have catalysis by enzymes, regulation, sometimes regulation of uh, enzymatic catalysis by hormones, transport by hemoglobin, which has already been mentioned. And I give you just one indication of why we want to know about three-dimensional structures of these uh, linear chains. When we look at enzymes, hormones, or transport proteins, we find that these proteins can only work if they are soluble in water. They all work in body fluids, which are aqueous solutions of proteins and other components. Now, if hair and skin were soluble in water, we would have a problem of sorts, right? We would probably not be here because we were caught in a thunderstorm without an umbrella one of these days and there we would have gotten, uh, gone down the gutter after dissolving in, in the rainfall. So and we cannot understand the difference in the behavior of hair and skin from the properties of enzymes, hormones and hemoglobins if we only know the linear chemical structure of these polypeptide chains, we must know, well, this doesn't always work, apparently, 
we must, we must know the three-dimensional structure. And this has important consequences also with regard to economy, health support, and so on. I show this to you with a particular example. This example is studies of a drug, cyclosporin A, which is a small itself a small protein. Now, cyclosporin A is a, an important drug because thanks to this drug, organ transplantation in human medicine could be started. It is, it is the first and the only drug in the 1980s which could prevent repulsion of foreign tissue after transplantation. As a result, it is also economically viable and it sold for $1.5 billion a year already in the 1980s, which was a real blockbuster at the time for the Sandos company in Basel, in Switzerland. It still, it still uh, sells for about the same amount of money or so, this is no longer worth as much as it was in the 1980s. Now, this is a good drug because once a person has had an organ transplant, I'm talking about a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or a, or a cornea transplant, then that person has to eat uh, cyclosporin A every day for the remainder of his life. That's a good drug as opposed to a drug that's used to fight flu, which you eat for three days and then that's gone. You see what I mean? And this is also the reason why it is still sold at the high rate. Now here you have the structure of this, uh, the, of this drug molecule here, and it's bound to its primary receptor in the cell. So when you apply the drug to a human being, then the drug binds to a protein which has this structure. Okay, now since we have computers, we can remove the drug from its receptor. And then we see how the surface of the protein receptor is formed in the absence of the drug. And we see what is available as a binding site. And what we want to achieve, of course, is high stability of the complex that's formed between the drug and its primary receptor. And when you then look at the structure of the drug molecule, which you have here, it's a cyclic undecapeptide, then you find out by inspecting this surface that you obtained, from the structure determination that you might want to cut off a piece of the molecule here or add a little bit here or cut off this piece in order to better fit into this cavity on the surface of the receptor, achieve higher uh, binding specificity and in this way perhaps attain lower dosage and reduce unwanted side effects. As a matter of fact, uh, improved variants of cyclosporin A have now largely replaced the original molecule based on this sort of considerations and subsequent intense work by the medical chemists. So this is an example of NMR in structural biology. Why did we why did we choose this problem? Well, the drug had been introduced. There was a lot of money around. Sandos was ready to pay for the project, which was very expensive at the time because of the use of refined isotope labeling technology and so on. And we selected this particular project because it was related to a serious medical procedure. In this 
structural biology time, which is the time up to about 2000. We, we would work only with proteins. Now to understand properly what I'm talking about in this lecture, you have to appreciate the contents of this complete scheme, which is very simple and which was proposed by Crick's and I think by Sidney Brenner jointly in the late 1950s, it is referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. And it says that you have DNA, RNA, and protein in your system. And it's among DNA, RNA, and protein that molecular biology happens. The important point now for what I'm discussing today is that the DNA carries the information that is needed to make proteins in our bodies. And when we worked in the era of structural biology, we knew about this central dogma. We don't talk about RNA now. It's an unnecessary complication for the purpose of this lecture. We knew about this scheme, but we did not know how the DNA looked. There was no way to learn about the sequence of the DNA. There was very little information about sequences of RNAs. And so we were limited to the protein, uh, the, uh, how should I say, well, to the proteins that were available to us. Now, proteins have the property of being either highly abundant in our bodies or present in very low concentrations in order to perform their functions. Typically, transport proteins such as hemoglobin are present in very high amounts and hormones would be present in nano nanomolar or lower uh, concentrations to perform their functions. So it would be literally impossible to isolate and purify sufficient amounts of a hormone in order to determine a structure, whereas hemoglobin, you could get 10 grams from taking a liter of blood from a horse or from a human, and you were in business and you could start to work. And this is how uh, structural biology indeed started in around 1957 with crystallography, which uses protein crystals. And much later did we come in with the NMR method to determine protein structures in solution. And the heroes of this early work with X-ray diffraction on hemoglobin and myoglobin were Max Perutz and John Kendrew. And I know that they both visited Madras in 1965 for a very early Congress on Structural Biology, which was organized by Professor Ramachandran. And I attended a follow-up meeting here in 1978, which was uh, which was organized after the departure of Professor Ramachandran. It was organized by Professor Srinivasan, who was an X-ray crystallographer and who followed uh, Ramachandran in his position as a professor. I don't remember in which school this was here in Madras. Uh, we, held, held, uh, we held a meeting in a hotel and it was a very high level meeting again. Now, you see here Perut holding a polypeptide chain in his hands. And this is the equivalent to my belt, okay? And then he determines the structure of hemoglobin. And this presentation is the state of the art in 1965, and it was the state of the art also in 1965. Uh, 68 uh, up to about 2000. 
What we see here are laminated wood platelets which are pasted on top of each other in order to give you an idea of the outline, where helices are, where the chain goes, and the model also shows the location of the sites, the so-called heme groups which bind oxygen. But, of course, there is no way to make statements about uh, individual atoms or movements of atoms uh, and so on. And so, uh, there was something to be done by NMR. And you see here, as was announced before, this is my own hemoglobin, which I hoped if I studied it, I would uh, qualify for the Olympics. I failed, but it did bring some other advantages to my career. And uh, it is so that, it, it, I don't want to explain the spectrum, but all these lines tell directly what happens around the heme groups of hemoglobin. And they showed that in contrast to the statements by, uh, by Perutz, there were major changes in the structure of the individual chains. There are four chains in hemoglobin when oxygen is taken up, and not only changes in the arrangement of the four subunits relative to each other.